Mind and Matter podcast. I'm your host, Nick Jacomis, and today I'm speaking with Dr. David Nichols. Before describing the episode, just a reminder that last week I started a weekly newsletter. The Mind and Matter newsletter goes out every Friday, and it'll be going out this week for the second week in a row. In that newsletter, I will provide updates about the podcast, including our last guest, who I talked to this week, and who some of the upcoming guests I'm speaking to will be. I will also provide links to interesting scientific studies and findings that I see in the literature, and a resource that allows you to actually read those studies, even if they're stuck behind a paywall. I will also link out to any interesting science-related topics that are being covered in the news that I think you'll find interesting. And I'll share things like excerpts and quotes from some of the books and other literature that I'm reading, and occasionally also just some of my thoughts on the general topics I was talking about in the podcast or that I'm linking to in the newsletter. So again, in the episode description, you'll find links to where you can sign up for that, or you can do it through my website, www.nickjacomas.com. Anyways, my guest for this week is medicinal chemist David Nichols. David was a professor at Purdue University for many years. He ran a lab studying the pharmacology and chemistry of psychedelics, among other things. He has studied everything from LSD to MDMA to a variety of other research chemicals that are very interesting. He is now retired and he's doing some work at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, in the lab of Brian Roth, who I spoke to many weeks ago on the podcast. And he's rec- recognized as one of the world's leading experts in the chemistry and pharmacology of psychedelic drugs. So I talked with David for about an hour. I actually spoke with his son, Charles Nichols, in the second episode of the podcast. Charles is also a pharmacologist who works on psychedelic drugs. And with David, we discussed all sorts of stuff. We discussed his history and relationship with the famous or infamous chemist Alexander Sasha Shulgin. We talked about some of the research and some of the science around the pharmacology and chemistry of tryptamine psychedelics like LSD, of phenethylamines like mescaline and MDMA. And we talked about his perspective on some of the research and some of the startups that have been popping up recently looking to use psychedelics to make novel therapeutics. So if you're interested in psychedelics, especially the the science around the chemistry and pharmacology of psychedelics, this will be a very interesting episode. Today's show is brought to you in part by Dosist, an all-natural cannabis company specializing in dose-controlled cannabis products made with plant-based ingredients. To learn more about Dosist, their products, and where they are available, please visit their website through the link in the episode description. So with that, here's my conversation with David Nichols. Professor David Nichols, thank you for joining me. Good day. Happy to be here. Can you tell everyone briefly who you are and what you've studied throughout your career at a high level? So I was a professor at Purdue University until 2012. I was there 38 years. Um, I taught graduate students and undergraduates in pharmacy school. I started uh, my graduate research in 1969 at University of Iowa, and I actually worked on um, psychedelics for my PhD, um, what were called psychotomimetics then, and then evolved to be hallucinogens, and now I think are more properly called psychedelics. And I continued working on those when I went to Purdue. Um, I got research grants to study those as well as some other areas. Um, And uh, pretty much was an academic scientist uh, with a major theme being psychedelics, chemistry and pharmacology of psychedelic agents. I had another program that ran for about the same length of time looking at um, dopamine D1 agonists, which would be for treatment of Parkinson's or for schizophrenia. And then for uh, 10 or 12 years, I had another grant to study MDMA and similar agents. And uh, in 1993, I started the Hefter Research Institute. I founded it to uh, get money from philanthropists to fund clinical studies of psychedelics. So we funded sort of the first clinical studies of psychedelics in this modern, what we call a modern era. <clears throat> so in terms of scientists who've studied psychedelics in the lab, you have had I think one of the longest careers of anyone, you, you've probably put more years into this than just about any other scientist. Is that right? That's probably true. And it's interesting to me that not only you've been doing it for so long, but you were doing this at sort of 
peak drug war. So what was it like? What was it like just getting all of the licenses you needed to actually do this work? So um, the Controlled Substances Act was passed in 1970. Um, and I was a graduate student then. So I was working on psychedelics. <clears throat> and then when the Controlled Substances Act was passed, I thought, well, you know, I'll just enjoy my graduate career um, because there's probably no chance I'll be able to get a job doing that afterward. And when I started looking for positions, I had really had two alternatives at that point. One was to work on oral contraceptives for a company back east. And the other was to take an academic position. And uh, I didn't know too much about ac academic positions, but I knew about industry. And uh, But I did know in academic positions, you could work on your own projects um, if you could get them funded. So that attracted me. And I went to Purdue University in 1974. <clears throat> so during your time at Purdue, I believe your lab, among other things, was actually synthesizing LSD. Is that correct? Yes, we had um, we had colonies of rats trained to recognize the the drug effects of many drugs, but LSD was one. And we we used uh, LSD trained rats for a number of our studies. So every year we made 100, 150 milligrams of LSD, which we used because we had a colony of 12 to 14 rats that would be injected almost on a daily basis with LSD. So, hmm. yes. <clears throat> so. One thing I wanted to ask you about LSD is if you could just walk everyone through what exactly it is, chemically, what it looks like, and where it comes from. What What is the sort of natural origin of the precursors of this, and, and how is it made, generally speaking? Um, originally, it was obtained from infected rye grains. Um, they would get infected with the ergot fungus. Ergot, uh, er, er, ergot uh, will produce these dark uh, kernels that are called ergot that are a sort of a dormant form of the ergot fungus. Um, and uh, those, they're called, the dark black things are called sclerotia. They, if you look at a, a stalk of rye or some grain, if it's been infected with ergot fungus, you'll see these, um, not all of them, but some of them, they won't look like grains so much as enlarged dark black grains, kind of. <clears throat> and uh, in the Middle Ages, you had scourges of ergotism. Um, those, the ergot fungus produces what are called ergot alkaloids. And uh, in the ergot fungus, if you eat bread that's contaminated with ergot, it'll cause the blood vessels in your fingers and toes to constrict, among other things. And uh, if, you, if you continue eating that bread and you poison yourself, what happens is your toes and fingers take on a black burned appearance and fall off. So, um, and there's a lot of pain associated with that. So <clears throat> um, it was a scourge throughout the middle ages, like 40,000 people died of ergot poisoning. Hmm. So uh, Sandoz laboratories in uh, Basel, Switzerland had been working on ergot. So you can extract the alkaloids out and there are a number of alkaloids that occur that are produced by the ergot fungus. So um, Albert Hoffman, whose PhD work was to, de to determine the structure of chitin, which is the exoskeleton on lobsters and insects and so forth. That's what he did for his PhD. And then he was recruited to go to, to Sandoz and work. <clears throat> and he worked on a number of projects, but at a certain point, he went to the research director and wanted to work on the ergot fungus. So he made uh, quite a few derivatives of uh, these ergot uh, compounds. It's hard for me to explain what it is, but it's a, ergots are built on what would be called an ergoline nucleus. So if you could see the structure, you have four rings that are fused together. And then um, at one position, you have um, a carboxylic acid function coming off. <clears throat> and that can be uh, converted into a number of different kinds of amides. So lysergic acid, diethylamide, um, you take lysergic acid and couple it with diethylamine and you get a diethylamide at this, what's called the eight position. So there was a compound um, known as coramine or nicethamide, which was a respiratory stimulant. And Hoffman uh, apparently made LSD because 
nicotinamide or coramine has a diethyl amide. It's a, it's a nicotinamide. It's a, like a nicotine derivative that has a diethyl amide attached to it. So he thought if he made an ergot with a diethyl amide, like the nicotinamide had, that what he would get is a very potent respiratory stimulant. And of course, that he didn't, that isn't what happened. He got a very potent compound, but it wasn't a respiratory stimulant. It's kind of amazing. <clears throat> that's the story of the discovery that's kind of interesting because he made LSD in 1938 first. He made a whole series of compounds. And then he says he was sitting down eating his lunch five years later in 1943. I think he even said he had a cucumber sandwich or something like that. <laughs> anyway, he was sitting there thinking, and the pharmacology department had told him that LSD did not look very promising in their models. They had mostly mouse models where they give the drug to a mouse and see what happened. <clears throat> so he thought, you know, maybe they missed something. So he synthesized another sample with the idea he would send it back down to the pharmacology department. And uh, in industry, if you make a compound and the pharmacologists evaluate it and they don't find anything interesting and they tell you this isn't interesting, it's very rare that you would make another sample and go back and tell the pharmacologist, you know, I think you screwed something up. You must have missed something. Why don't you do this again? He said he had, it was translated from German as a peculiar presentiment. It's like he had a gut feeling, basically, that they had missed something. Well, he didn't even get to send it down to the pharmacology department because somehow in the preparation of the sample on a Friday uh, in April 1943, the 16th of April, <clears throat> he started uh, having visions, seeing kaleidoscopic patterns, feeling very strange, went home early uh, from work and tried to think about what he had worked with that might have caused that. And the only new chemical he'd worked with was this LSD-25. It's the 25th in the series of compounds he'd made. I don't know how many he made, maybe 80 or so. So he went back on Monday and took, made, took a, an amount and weighed it out and put it into a solution so that he took 250 micrograms, thinking that this would be an amount that really wouldn't have any effect because it was such a tiny amount, one-fourth of a milligram. But of course, 250 micrograms is a pretty hefty dose for most people. So that was the point at which he said, okay, it's the LSD. And then he gave it to colleagues. They didn't, they didn't believe him. The head of research didn't believe me. So there's nothing that potent. So they tried it. They, they didn't want to take 250 micrograms. So they took 80 micrograms, but that was still enough of a dose for them to realize, yeah, this is, this is what it is. So chemically, um, <clears throat> there are four rings fused together. It's sensitive to light, to ultraviolet light. If you take a solution of LSD and, and put it in a, in a window where there's sunlight, it'll destroy it all in about an hour. Mm. Um, so it is, a, it is a very sensitive molecule, sensitive to light, heat, um, and acid conditions. But um, I don't know, does that cover enough of it? <clears throat> yes. So to summarize some of that, basically LSD, the, the molecule, it is bigger and more complex than other psychedelics like psilocybin, say. Yes, it's, it's very potent. What is why is it so potent and long lasting? Well, um, we're not really sure, but when we published the crystal structure of LSD in the serotonin to B receptor in 2017, Brian Roth is the lab director, and so we published the structure. Um, we had known from when I was still at Purdue before I retired that um, there's a piece of the receptor. So this receptor threads back and forth in the neuronal membrane inside to outside and inside to outside, there are seven helices packed together. And so obviously if you have something coming up and it goes back down, there's a loop between that. So there's a piece of receptor protein that hooks the top of helix four to the top of helix five. And it has a residue there, a, a leucine residue, which is a hydrophobic amino acid. It's leucine 229 is in that loop. We had shown previously that um, we thought that was an important residue for binding. When you, when you use a computer to dock LSD in the receptor, the diethylamide was projecting up toward the extracellular part of the receptor where that extracellular loop was. So uh, it turns out that <clears throat> if you do the receptor kinetics with LSD in the receptor that's got that leucine 229, it takes several hours 
for LSD to equilibrate with the receptor. And it takes even longer for it to come back out of the receptor. So if you have a receptor preparation, typically it would be like a cellular preparation that has a serotonin 2A receptor expressed in it. You incubate it with tritium labeled radioactive LSD. And then uh, you can take aliquots out and you can determine how much is in the receptor, how much is in the solution. So it takes three hours or so at 37 degrees Celsius to equilibrate. And then if you wash off the receptor and put fresh buffer with no radioactive LSD in, and then take aliquots out, you can see it coming back out of the receptor. And it takes six to eight hours to come back out of the receptor. So what we did, no, we were pretty sure that leucine 229 was important. So we mutated the receptor. We made a mutant receptor where we converted that uh, leucine 229 into an alanine. Alanine is just a very small amino acid with a single methyl group. And when you, we did that, LSD got into the receptor very fast, came back out very fast. So what we think is um, that, that the fact that LSD gets essentially trapped in the receptor by this loop, gets trapped in the receptor, we think that's what holds it in there. And if you think about um, blood having LSD in it and circulating past those receptors, a little bit gets in the receptor every time the blood goes by. So it slowly accumulates in the receptor. And then um, once the LSD is cleared from your blood, then the LSD has a lot of trouble coming back out. So it has to do with the, the, actually the shape of the receptor and the fact that once LSD gets in there, the receptor kind of locks it in, it traps it inside. So we think that's part of the explanation as to why it's so potent <clears throat> and long lasting. And my understanding is you've actually created and worked with LSD analogs, and some of them are very commonly used in experimental settings that are actually even more potent. I think one of them is DOI. What, so what is that compound? Well, DOI is a, it's actually a substituted amphetamine more related to mescaline. Hmm. Among, among the LSD analogs, we made um, a compound called LSZ, which showed up in the, as a recreational chemical or research chemical. Um, where we changed the diethyl amide part of LSD <clears throat> into a four-membered ring with two methyl groups onto it. So it's kind of a locked diethyl amide. That's about as potent as LSD. And then we also, LSD has an, a methyl group attached to its nitrogen. So we replaced that with an ethyl and an allyl. And those compounds are a little more potent than LSD itself. Um, we haven't published much on the ethyl compound, but it turns out that the ethyl compound is actually a better stimulant of the serotonin 2A receptor than, than is LSD. Well, if you go to, and so if you go to Arrowwood, there are accounts there of people who have taken FLAD, which is what we called it, ALAD was the allyl, and LSC. Those, are, those got out as research chemicals and people took them. So there are reports of those on Arrowwood. <clears throat> hmm. What is Arrowwood? Can you explain that for people? That was... Um, a site set up by a couple called Earth, they call themselves Earth and Fire Airwood. That's obviously not their real name, but that's what everybody calls them, Earth and Fire. And so it's, an, it's a digital source where uh, people put the, their drug experiences. So you can go and look, they're called the Airwood Vaults. So you can go to the Airwood Vaults and you can find all kinds of uh, self-reports of people who've taken various kinds of drugs and posted them on Airwood. So it's, uh, you know, they're, they're anecdotal reports, but still when there's no scientific data on these, you can go and say, well, this compound looks interesting or this compound was a terrible compound or, or whatever. <clears throat> it's a very interesting website. It's very much in the spirit, I think, of Alexander Shulgin. Could you explain for people who Alexander Shulgin was and what your relationship with him was? So Alexander... <clears throat> or Sasha Shogun, which is what a lot of his friends called him. He was a, um, a biochemist who did his PhD in natural products chemistry and then went to work for Dow Chemical. And then he parted ways with Dow Chemical. Um, and there are various stories about why, why and how that happened. But uh, he was an only child. <clears throat> and uh, his parents left him the house that they, they lived in when they passed. He calls it the farm. It's in Berkeley. Uh, it's actually Walnut Creek, California. So there was an old barn behind that house that burned down, and the barn had a concrete block foundation. 
So he put a roof on top of it and converted it into a chemical synthesis lab. So he worked there from the late 60s up until um, he passed away. I don't remember when it was. It's been five or six years ago, maybe. And he, was, he would make compounds uh, in the lab and test them on himself. He would start at low doses and then increase the doses. And then if it had any kind of a psychedelic effect or anything that he thought was interesting, um, he would um, give it to his wife, Anne, and she would take it. He, and he knew, sort of knew their sensitivities for these things. And then if she thought it was an interesting compound, he had a group of friends who lived in the area and they would get together occasionally and he would dose them all up with this new molecule he'd made. So uh, he has two books. One is called PCAL, P-I-H-K-E-L, which stands for phenethylamines I've known and loved. And another one called TCAL, T-I-H-K-L, tryptamines I've known and loved. And what they are, <clears throat> PCAL is the um, first half of it. It's a big, thick book. The first half of it is an, uh, sort of autobiography of the two of them. And the second half of the book is a compendium of all the molecules that they made and tested on themselves with, uh, and with their friends. So it lists, a, it lists doses that were found to be effective for the compounds, the general type of, of psychological effect that they had. And so those are really peak how and peak how are sort of a summary of his life work making these compounds um, and then testing them on himself and, and then his friends. So it's, it's a useful source. I mean, not, not many people would want to do something like that, but it's useful when you're trying to do uh, work. For example, when we were trying to validate our rat models, uh, we could take a compound that he'd made that said it's active at such and such a dose. We could give that to the rats and see how they responded. So it was a, it was a way to point us in the direction of compounds that were most interesting, I would say. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so he's got these two volumes. One of them focuses on this class of compounds called phenethylamines. Right. The other one focuses on tryptamines. Starting with right. phenethylamines, can you just explain for people what, what kind of drug a phenethylamine is and what are some of the, the more well-known examples of medicinally, <coughs> medicinally interesting phenethylamines? Phenethylamines are the simplest kinds of structures of psychedelics. And probably the prototype in that class is mescaline. Um, I don't know how conversant your uh, listeners are in, in chemistry, but mescaline has a single aromatic ring, or we call it a benzene ring or phenyl ring, and has three methoxy groups attached to it. So CH3 attached to an oxygen, then attached to the ring. There are three of them at the three, four, and five positions. And then it has a side chain um, that comes off at what would be the, the one position. So two carbon side chain, two carbons with an NH2, an amino group on the very end. <clears throat> so um, mescaline is produced naturally by the peyote cactus and, uh, and other uh, uh, Southern South American cacti where um, people have um, cut those cacti up and boiled them and, and use them for, um, for psychedelic effect. Peyote is used by the Native American church as their sacrament, and they have protection of the constitution to use peyote. So they'll have um, ceremonies for weddings, um, celebrations of life. Um, they'll get together, the road man will lead, this, will lead the ceremony, and they will pass around and they will chew peyote buttons or a tea that's been made from peyote buttons. The peyote, it's, the peyote buttons are the cut off tops of the cactus. So they'll take those. So that's the simplest molecule in the phenethylamines. And its dose um, as a hydrochloride or sulfate salt would be between 250, maybe 350 milligrams. It's probably the least potent of the psychedelics. But you can modify it. And the reason that Sasha and I did so much work on that, it's very easy to modify. So we could change the positions of the methoxy groups on the aromatic ring, on the benzene ring. We can add, um, we can add another carbon to the side chain and alpha methyl, make it like an amphetamine so it didn't break down very easily. Um, and you can get some compounds that are quite potent. So DOI that you mentioned earlier, <clears throat> on the aromatic ring, whereas mescaline is a 3,4,5 trimethoxy, DOI is a 2,5 dimethoxy with an iodine atom at the four position. And it's quite potent, whereas mescaline 250 to 350 milligrams 
a, a DOI would be in the order of a couple or two or three milligrams to have a similar kind of effect. Most of the phenethylamines are probably not as, Sasha would have called them sparkly, um, as mescaline. Mescaline has, produces a lot of visuals and a, a lot of uh, interesting um, uh, visual, well, visual so I hesitate to call them hallucinations, but visual abstractions and uh, colorful patterns that would, would go in tune with the music if you were listening to a record or something like that. Some of the more potent ones don't really do that. They, they produce a CNS effect. They stimulate you to keep you awake and have some psychedelic effect, but they're not as um, dramatic in terms of their effects as something like mescaline. <clears throat> what about MDMA? Does MDMA fall into this general class? MDMA is a phenethylamine. Uh, we could call it a substitute amphetamine. It's 3,4-methylene-doxymethamphetamine. So on the aromatic ring, instead of three methoxies like mescaline, you got two oxygens hooked together with a CH2, and that's called a methylene dioxy in the three, four positions. And then it's got an alpha methyl in the side chain like an amphetamine, and it also has an N-methyl attached to the nitrogen. And the N-methyl um, destroys, for the most part, it's uh, actual psychedelic activity in, in terms of classical psychedelics. Classical psychedelics work by stimulating and activating a type of brain receptor called the serotonin 2A receptor. MDMA works differently. It works more like amphetamine or methamphetamine in that <clears throat> you have um, monoamine transporters on the, on the presynaptic terminals of your and brain neurons. And when they release a transmitter like serotonin or norepinephrine, you have transporters that clear the synapse and pump the neurochemical back into the presynaptic neuron. So it recycles it so it can be used again. So MDMA works by causing the release of serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine. So it's a monoamine releaser rather than a direct stimulant of the receptor like the classical psychedelics like LSD or psilocin or mescaline would be. I see. Now, can you talk a little bit about what is actually scientifically known about, say, the neurotoxicity of MDMA. So if you give very large doses of MDMA to rats, what happens is if you look at them, and they have to be fairly large doses and usually they're repeated. If you look at the brains and analyze the brains of those rats for neurochemical content, what you find out is that the serotonin levels are depleted. It's been shown that the presynaptic serotonin terminals are destroyed in those experiments. <clears throat> um, it's not clear exactly how that happens. We did a lot of work looking at the so-called neurotoxicity. And MDMA releases serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine. Serotonin is not um, replenished as easily as dopamine and norepinephrine are. So, um, the studies that we did suggested that um, MDMA was very potent in releasing serotonin from serotonin neurons. But also, uh, and the serotonin just diffused away, but also it produced a lot of dopamine in the brains of rats. And the dopamine is actually a substrate for the serotonin transporter. Mm. So you get the serotonin neuron releases all of its serotonin and it's pretty much empty then. And then you have dopamine floats by and the serotonin transporter pulls the dopamine inside the serotonin neuron. And actually, as your body temperature increases, we published one experiment that showed that the serotonin transporter actually prefers to pump dopamine if body temperature goes up. So if you have people that are dancing and overheating, their serotonin terminals prefer to pump dopamine in. Hmm. Dopamine is a fairly toxic neurochemical. And in dopamine neurons, there are a number of um, components that prevent the dopamine from destroying the dopamine neurons. Um, ascorbic acid and uh, superoxide dismutation. There are about three different enzymes in there that will break the dopamine down and prevent it from killing the neuron. But when it gets into the serotonin neurons, there are no, none of those protective mechanisms mm. to protect against the toxicity of dopamine. So that's what we proposed is that the dopamine was pumped into serotonin neurons 
where it caused damage to the neurons through free radicals that were formed. And that would be compatible with the fact that you don't, you don't see the cell bodies destroyed by the MDMA. You see the neuron terminals destroyed and it kind of it burns back from there toward the cell body, but doesn't kill the cell bodies. But um, in the rats, you don't really see any sequelae to that. In humans, in, in humans who have used large uh, and repetitive doses, there, there's some indications that they may have some deficits in their memory, but it's not really clear. Mm-hmm. In general, um, my opinion, and I think most of the people who are using MDMA for therapy feel like, you know, one or two treatments with MDMA over a period of months or years is not going to cause that kind of toxicity. You really have to hammer people with large doses in hot spaces and, and dancing and repeatedly taking it. So it's really abuse of MDMA that would lead to toxic effects. I see. I see. So this other volume that Shulgin wrote, TCAL, is all about tryptamines. And so tryptamines include other psychedelics that people are familiar with. Can you just describe at the level of the chemistry what the difference between a tryptamine and a phenethylamine is? So in all of these compounds, you essentially have an aromatic system, two carbons removed from a nitrogen. So in mescaline, you have a 3 for 5 trimethoxy benzene and a two-carbon piece with a nitrogen. A tryptamine has a two as a two-ring fused uh, system called an indole. It's a six-membered ring fused to a five-membered nitrogen-containing ring. And it's the basis for serotonin, for example. It also then has a two-carbon piece attached to a nitrogen. And for most of the tryptamines, silos and DMT, the nitrogen has two methyl groups on it. So with mescaline, you just have NH2, it's just a single primary amine with most of the tryptamines, and that would include LSD actually, which is a special case of a tryptamine. Um, you have uh, two alkyl groups attached to it, so it's a tertiary amine. Uh, but they still have this aromatic system, two carbons away from a basic nitrogen. And that's kind of the template for all the things that interact at monoamine receptors. I did want to ask you about DMT. I think it was, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was you and maybe Charles, who wrote um, some kind of review paper looking at DMT facts and myths. And DMT is super interesting at the level of the chemistry, at the level of the effects, but it also seems to be one where many uh, myths or sort of half truths have permeated throughout the internet. And so can you just give people a short background of DMT, the basics of DMT, what it is and what we know about it? And I do have a few questions that I wanted to ask you that I see people saying a lot online. So I was invited to a breaking convention meeting in, I think it was 2017. And Dave King contacted me and he said, we, we were going to have a session on uh, DMT as a neurotransmitter. And I said, well, I don't believe it is. So you don't want me. He said, no, that's why we <laughs> want you there because the other people are going to say it is. And then we want your other opinion. So I gave the talk and I had a lot of colleagues afterward come up and say, you should publish that because this is out of control. Everybody's talking about DMT. Strassman had made a suggestion. I think that DMT might be produced by the pineal gland when people were born and when they died. So I wrote a, a paper which was published peer reviewed. And I said, this is just really not possible. Um, the pineal gland is 180 milligrams. Um, to get an intoxication with DMT, you'd need to produce about 25 milligrams. And it's, not, it's just not possible. And that's not it. its principal. Its principal um, function is to produce melatonin, which re- regulates the diurnal cycle, and it, it doesn't make that much melatonin. <clears throat> so, there, this idea that um, there's an endogenous psychedelic has really stirred up a lot of people's passions. Oh yeah, it's it's a psychedelic. Why does a human body make it? Why is it there? Well, it turns out DMT is made by lots of things, including lots of plants. And it's a component of the cerebrospinal fluid in lots of mammalian species. I think it's just there because there's an enzyme that methylates it and it's a byproduct. But um, they've come back and there was another paper by Dean et al. in 2019, which you may be referring to. My son and I wrote a response to that and said, you know, this is just crazy thinking. But it, it's such a popular meme. You know, this DMT is a really powerful substance. Well, it's powerful in the sense of what it does when you smoke an, 
or give an intravenous amount. But the amount it takes to do that is fairly substantial. And um, there's no evidence, you know, and they've gone in with, um, they've looked at um, microdialysis in brains of rats and they can detect trace amounts of DMT. Well, you, they can detect lots of things, but you know, that's what they're looking for. It's, you know, they're convinced that DMT is doing something. And so they're trying to prove how it's there and why it's there and what it's doing. I just don't, I just don't think it is um, from a pharmacology point of view, biochemical point of view. Um, there's no reason why it should be produced there. Um, and it's not produced in sufficient amounts. So then people say, well, you know, what about the lungs? There's a lot of, one of the, the methylation enzymes is the endolamine and methyltransferase, INMT. Say, so, well, there's a bunch of that in lungs. Why isn't it produced in the lungs? Um, what's, what's, what, what was its function being? You know, we're not hallucinating all the time. Oh, but when we die or when we have a near-death experience. And I pointed out, you don't need to invoke DMT because when you have a lot of stress, you have this whole endorphin system. You have uh, endorphin itself, which activates kappa receptors. Kappa receptors are the same receptors as salvinorin accent. And I said, you, and even in the papers um, uh, where they talked about killing these rats, uh, by suffocation and looking at the production of these compounds. I said, when you're stressed, all kinds of things are produced. It's a whole soup of neurochemicals that are, you know, you're killing the animal and everything is going awry. So you're going to pick DMT out when you've got all these other things. And endorphins are much more potent than DMT. Hmm. And you, you know that endorphins produce psychoactive effects in people. So there's just, in my opinion, there's just no reason to really look at it other than it's kind of a cute hypothesis. It, but, you know, plants don't hallucinate, plants produce it. So I just think it's a, I just think it's a metabolic byproduct. So to summarize, there's no known physiological function of DMT in the mammalian nervous system in the mammalian body. It's probably not produced at physiologically relevant levels. And the only time that they've seen sort of elevated levels was in the study that we're referring to by Strassman and others but the elevated levels of DMT, they found those, but everything was sort of elevated because that's just what happens when you kill an animal like that. Uh, they, they, they said it's a brainstorm of neurochemicals. So it's everything is being with serotonin, dopamine, everything's being released. So why, why pick out DMT? Because you know, it's activating a serotonin receptor. If you have massive amounts of serotonin produced, why would it select a tiny amount of DMT to produce an effect when it's being flooded with serotonin? So it just doesn't seem logical to me. There are people that argue with me because they, you know, they're committed to the belief that DMT is there. It's important, but um, I just don't think it is. There's no evidence for it. Hmm. Is there anything interesting about DMT medicinally that's known? Is there any uh, interesting potential there? There are some studies. I think David Olson did the first ones showing when you gave DMT to rats or mice, I can't remember which it was, that it stimulated synaptogenesis, hmm. stimulated uh, neurite outgrowth. So there are, I know there are companies now that 600 companies now trying to make money on psychedelics um, that are looking at DMT as a possible uh, antidepressant. I don't know how, you know, how they're going to do it, whether it's going to be um, by injection or, what, but I mean, there's some evidence that all these psychedelics have some effect on synaptogenesis and neurogenesis. Mm -hmm. And DMT apparently does that. It's very short acting. So, from a clinical perspective, I guess you could argue that if you were going to treat people for depression and it worked, you could put them in there and you could give them some intravenous DMT and the effect would last 15 or 20 minutes and then it would be over. Mm -hmm. So, you wouldn't have to spend hours and hours and hours like you would with LSD or mescaline. So, I think it may have some therapeutic value, but um, it's, it's, a, it's a weird compound. Mm -hmm. Now, somewhat related, so, so there's this big push to create psychedelic or psychedelic-derived medicines right now. A lot of it has to do with the potential for treating neuropsychiatric disorders that we have struggled to treat in new ways for a while, including depression. And there does seem to be this common thread of, you know, psilocybin and other compounds are inducing synaptogenesis, spinogenesis, that 
increased level of plasticity plausibly has something to do with the enhanced efficacy of, say, therapy that goes that goes along with that plasticity that helps treat the condition. But you know, as you mentioned, for something like psilocybin or LSD or or DMT, there's the hallucinogenic effects. For something like psilocybin or LSD, those are going to last for hours, and so clinically, it's it's sort of difficult to work with those compounds in that way, just because you have the hallucination, hallucinogenic effects, and you have to be committed to this hours long event that that you're going to participate in. So DMT is interesting because it's short acting in that way. But there's a big push to create non hallucinogenic psychedelics now. Can you comment on whether you think that's plausible? Has anyone created such a compound yet that's interesting? And is there any reason to believe that the actual psychedelic component of these experiences might be important for something like severe depression, say? So my thought on, there's been a lot of debate about whether or not you need the mystical transcendent experience. <clears throat> if, you, if you look at the stuff that Robin Card, Card, Card Harris has published about um, brain dynamics and resetting brain dynamics, I think that the psychedelic effects are a biomarker, if you will, or a behavioral uh, outcome of the reset mechanism that's taking place. So how can you increase global communications in the brain and reset your brain uh, networks without having some kind of behavioral output? So I, I, I don't think that the psychedelic effects per se are what produces a change, but they're a marker of the underlying biochemistry that's leading to the change. So that's kind of the way I see that. And so from that point of view, I don't know if you can, um, you know, obviously if you came up with something that worked like an SSRI, a standard antidepressant, um, those have some antidepressant effects. It may well be that if you think of all the people who suffer from depression, that you could give them a pill or maybe it would cure them of depression. But I think when you start talking about some other indications, you know, um, end of life. The people who are treated with psychedelics at end of life, they have a whole process where they go through mentally and look at their life and what they've done and their relationships with their siblings and, and significant others. And I think that's part of the process of them coming to grips with the fact that they're dying. And I just don't think you can give those people a pill and that will have the same effect. I think the same thing is true for addictions, alcohol or substance mm -hmm. use disorders. The people that have those, um, they'll look at when they started uh, abusing, when did they start their addiction, um, what's kept them what's kept them doing it. Well, you know, were there family things that happened, were there family events, um, bad marriages? What? And I think there's a need to to really cogitate and look at that. And that, to some extent, is what happens in the integration phase after the drug has worn off where then you go back and most people that are doing this therapy feel like the integration phase is very important mm -hmm. to tie those ends back together. So, um, you know, in some cases, you know, there's a story, there was a case report by um, Brandon and Vanguard, some Scandinavian psychiatrist years ago, a person who had severe obsessive compulsive disorder to the extent that he became completely disabled he couldn't go to work anymore. He'd get up in the morning. He would spend four hours washing his hands. And if somebody flushed the toilet, you have to go wash his hands. This extreme fear of contamination. And um, this was a 10-year follow-up. This person was given LSD, I think, once a month for 15 months without any therapy at all. And completely recovered. His, these people said he had a better personality after than he'd ever had before. Was, went back to his job, was promoted. So this was a 10 year follow-up and they said, you know, we did no therapy. This guy completely was healed by, you know, periodic doses of LSD. So there's a case where you didn't really need therapy, but it was, you know, a year's worth of whatever he was, you know, going through his mind when that was happening. So I think it kind of depends, you know, with MDMA, which is not a classical psychedelic, you're talking about people who have been traumatized, mm -hmm. either um, physical violence or rape or things like that, or wartime, trauma. And though in that case, you really don't, the person really isn't isolated. You, you talk to the person. Um, the idea is to get them to separate the memory of the event from the affective component so they can see it, but it doesn't come into their lives like it, like it does before the treatment. 
And there's where, uh, you know, you just can't give a pill and make that happen. That requires some verbal therapy. So I think it depends. I think there are cases, you know, maybe in endogenous depression where they use, you know, a Prozac or an SSRI now, it may be that you could ha have a pill that would do that without any psychedelic effects. I'm not sure what the mechanism of action would be, but uh, I don't know if you can stimulate that receptor without producing psychedelic effects because of where it is and, and, and the importance of its function. Okay. So it's fair to say that we don't know if you could create such a drug, but you would not bank on it. I wouldn't invest a lot of money in a company trying to do that. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, and there's a company trying to do that, but um, they may be able to come up with something that's an antidepressant for the for endogenous depression, but um, I don't think it's going to have the, the widespread value of treating other like, substance use disorder and end of life and um, things like that. I don't, I don't think it would have the value that a psychedelic has. I and of see. course, all the, you know, all the mainstream medical people in media, I mean, they're saying, Oh, you know, nobody wants to have hallucinations. We got to cut the period short and, you know, make it so they come in and come back out really quickly and they don't spend a lot of time there. But if you talk to people that are given a psychedelic, in most cases, they found it a very rewarding experience. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure you really want to say, well, this is an important and make the assumption that people don't want to have that experience. I think many people want to have that experience. Yeah. I, I talked to a, a man named John Costacopoulos on the podcast who did three doses of psilocybin to treat severe alcoholism. And he said literally after the first dose, he had never had a drink again after six years. But when he describes it, it it's very clear that, you know, he was rewarded by the vid when he describes the visions he had, it was clear that they were meaningful and they were part of that process. When he describes the integration, the whole thing, like there's no way that he would have elected to give that component up. Yeah, no, I think that's true. I mean, especially if you talk to people at end of life, cancer patients, I mean, they have an experience that, that gives them a new perspective. They lose their fear of death. And that's one of the oldest, those studies of uh, cancer patients go back into the 1960s at Spring Grove hospital. There's no reason, there's no way those people would give that experience up. So I, I think um, uh, people that say, well, you know, where's a big need for compounds that don't produce that experience. Um, I would temper that argument by saying, I'm not sure that's really true. Mm -hmm. There may be, like I said, endogenous depression where people would just take a pill and maybe get better. Like, a, you know, what we have now, but in these other situations with addiction and end of life and some of these other things, I think that the, uh, the integration and the perspective that they gain under the influence of the, the substance is important to the overall uh, therapy. Mm -hmm. What is your general take on the phenomenon of microdosing psychedelics that's become very popular? People, you know, on the one hand, you can take a dose that's low enough that you can still feel it. It's still doing something, even though it's not a full hallucinatory experience. On the other hand, you know, when I, you know, this has become very trendy and it almost seems like it's flirting with homeopathy at some point where people are bragging about how low of a dose they're taking. Do you think it's plausible that you could take a, a reasonably low dose of something like psilocybin, say, and you're not going to have full blown hallucinations, but there is some sort of potential efficacy there for, for something? So we have not seen a randomized controlled trial to prove that microdosing does anything. Um, LSD gets into the receptor and stays there for a long time. I could believe that maybe 20 to 25 micrograms of LSD might have a physiological effect. Uh, low doses of psilocybin, it doesn't get caught in the receptor like that. So I, I'm frankly antagonistic to the concept that that does anything. It certainly has become a powerful meme and everybody's talking about it and it's just, but you know, it's, there's, you know, the placebo effect is really powerful. Mm -hmm. um, and I think for most of these, it's probably a placebo effect. You think it's going to do something, so it does something. Well, I'm microdosing mushrooms, and I feel so much better now. Well, is there a way to verify that? So until somebody actually runs a trial that's controlled, randomized, placebo-controlled, um, I'm going to withhold my judgment. Um, I spoke with Brian Roth, one of, one of my early episodes on the podcast, and I believe he mentioned that, so technically you've retired from, from your lab, but now you're in his lab actually doing, still doing research. Is that accurate? 
right? I've done some research there. And then I still, um, I go, I, I join his group meetings and have comments from time to time. I'm waiting on some chemicals to come in to finish a last project and, and they've been ordered, back ordered forever. But um, I was more active for a while, but now as time has gone on, I mean, I, I retired in 2012 and I've been going into Brian's lab for, well, seven or eight years. That's longer than it took me to do my PhD and postdoc put together. <laughs> so it's like, I, I want to write some books. I haven't had a chance to write books, but yeah, I haven't, I have not completely withdrawn from the field entirely. What, uh, what do you want to write about? Well, I, someone told me I should write my memoirs and I thought, no, nobody's going to be interested. And then my oldest son said, yeah, yeah, people would be interested to hear about you. So maybe I have, um, years of correspondence with Sasha Shogun. Mm. And I thought of a book called Con- Conversations with Sasha, where I pulled out little nuggets from our correspondence. And then I have a science fiction book that I'm, I have the idea for that I'm working on. Interesting. Interesting. What, uh, what do you think is most exciting right now in the research world with respect to psychedelics for you personally? Oh, I think um, in general, uh, structural biology uh, the strides that they've made now in being able to identify, um, you know, active and in a, active and inactive receptors. Brad Roth's lab is, he's like, I said, how many structures do you have you haven't published? I asked him this a couple weeks ago. And he said, I think we have about 30. So he has active and inactive stru- structures. He's doing a whole big project now on looking at different psychedelics, looking at which receptors they bind to and don't bind to to for the first time establish a big library of data for what these compounds do. I think um, they activate the serotonin 2A receptor. That may be uh, necessary, but maybe not sufficient. I don't know. There hasn't been a psychedelic that lacks, for example, uh, all the psychedelics activate the serotonin 2A and 2C receptors. And to a certain extent, 2B, but 2C. And 2C receptors, if you activate them functionally, they oppose the activation of serotonin 2A receptors. Hmm. So what happens if you make a selective, highly selective serotonin 2A receptor ligand that doesn't activate the 2C receptor? So it may be possible to come up with better therapeutics that are more specific for just activating the serotonin 2A receptor. So the idea of that, um, and also looking at some of these structures, which largely have not been published yet, that Brian's lab has been working on and seeing like why this compound is active and this one isn't, what's the difference in the way they uh, change the shape of the receptor. The at the molecular level, I think is a really exciting stuff. Mm -hmm. Is that potentially what you just mentioned about activating multiple receptors simultaneously? Could you imagine that say the difference between the effects of DMT and psilocybin might be because, you know, one has slightly higher or lower, affinity for the 2C receptor or something like that. How, how would you generally think about the difference in the effects for these things, even though they're all 2A receptor agonists? Yeah, it could be. I would, I would tend to focus a bit on the serotonin 1A receptor. Hmm. If you do animal studies with 5-methoxy-DMT, quote unquote toad venom, um, the effect is primarily mediated in rodents through activation of the serotonin 1A receptor. So all the tryptamines activate the 1A receptor, but the phenethylamines don't. So no one has really dissected out and said, you know, to what extent is the 1A receptor important for the psychopharmacology of the tryptamines? That's something that hasn't been really teased out yet that I think would be interesting. Um, those, are, if you look at what these, the targets that they hit, it's really 2A, 2C, a little 2B sometimes, and for tryptamines, 1A, um, but right now in the lab, they're screening these at receptors where they have relatively low affinity. If you look at mescaline, mescaline doesn't have very high affinity for the serotonin 2A receptor. The dose is 300 milligrams, essentially. So it takes a lot. When you get a dose that large, there may well be some other receptors that are involved that nobody has really looked at before. So mescaline is unique in that respect. So there's still, still a bit to be done. I mean, actually quite a bit, but. <laughs> Interesting. Um, in the last few minutes we have, do you have any final thoughts you want to leave people with about psychedelic research in general? Um, I think 
with respect to psychedelic research, the big thing that sticks in everybody's mind is the fact that this research we're doing now has been stalled for about 50 years because of the drug war, which was never really legitimate to begin with. It was, according to John Ehrlichman, it was to keep people from voting. Um, and the fact that these might be breakthrough therapies for depression, anxiety, end of life distress, um, alcohol and substance use disorders, we probably could have had these. We wouldn't have as much information about the underlying mechanisms like the, the brain dynamics and brain entropy that, Carr, that Robin Carr Harris has been talking about. We might not have the mechanistic stuff, but these could have been used in the 60s. I mean, they were using the LSD to treat cancer patients in the 60s, and then everything just got shut down. Now, this is just an example of how damaging politics can be when it gets involved in legitimate scientific research. So that's a message that everyone should realize. And, um, and people are still, even today, they're afraid of psychedelics because of all the stuff they've heard in the past but it'll liquefy your spinal cord and it'll cause mutations and your babies will be mutated. A lot of people still have those ideas, especially the older generation, people my age, unfortunately, um, are not really up, up on what these things actually do and, and what they could be for. So I think in the next couple of years, it's gonna be interesting to watch the sociological and cultural aspects of this play out. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's any risk that we have some kind of backlash just with the prominence culturally that psychedelics are are coming back to and, and the level of popularity and the level of interest that there is just generally speaking? Yeah, I think there is that danger. I mean, um, in the 60s, according to John Ehrlichman, it was all the hippies smoking marijuana and using LSD. And uh, according to Ehrlichman, they knew they couldn't uh, keep them from um, using the drugs, but they could keep him from voting by arresting him for using the drugs. And then they would have a felony conviction and they wouldn't be able to vote. So they were, they were anti-establishment. So the, the original basis for, you know, the illegality of the drug war was because they were anti-establishment. I mean, even marijuana with the Marijuana Tax Act in 1937 under Harry Anslinger, that was, um, that was Congress has sold a bill of goods on that by being told that Mexican laborers were coming across the border with marijuana, giving it to white women and raping them and killing them. You know, like, oh my God, everybody's freaking out. We can't have this. So the politics need to be taken out of it. And fortunately, um, it's being taken out, but I, we still worry about, um, you know, decriminalization in, in uh, Oregon. So I support decriminalization. I've told people that. I don't think if you're in your house using um, a psychedelic in a sacramental spiritual way, um, the police don't have any right to come in and arrest you for using a psychedelic. But I don't think they should be available over the counter. They're not benign. They, they can damage some people. So this whole thing has to get sorted out and we're not there yet, but I think we're moving in a positive direction. I don't, the fact that so many scientists and medical institutions are doing the research, I think is, is going to prevent it from becoming too crazy like we saw in the 60s where it was just everybody was taken there was no controls and so well professor nichols thank you for your time and your knowledge and and for what it's worth if you ever get around to publishing those letters with sasha i'll definitely buy a copy i think a lot of people want copies of that so i just have to find the time